Ever since the very beginning of Dungeons & Dragons, its relationship with the Lord of the Rings IP has been a very complicated one. From as far back as the 1970s, when the first edition of D&D was released, the publisher of the tabletop, TSR, had come into legal trouble with the copyright holders of Tolkien's works regarding certain aspects of the game. Gary Gygax, the creator of Dungeons & Dragons, was deeply inspired by the Lord of the Rings, and it was under that heavy influence that D&D, in its first edition, featured creatures such as elves, dwarfs and dragons, and most importantly, hobbits, balrogs and ends, under those exact names. This caused Tolkien Enterprises to bring TSN to court for the removal of all of these creatures from the game, ultimately resulting in an out-of-court settlement that oversaw the hobbits becoming the halflings, the ants becoming the trents, and the balrogs the balor. With the rest of the creatures however being kept in the game after considering their position in popular culture outside of Tolkien's writings. In the years that followed, the Dungeons & Dragons team made sure to distance the tabletop from the Lord of the Rings IP in order to avoid another lawsuit. They changed the physical appearance of the halflings, put their own spin on the Balors, and gradually gave their fantasy races and creatures their own unique backgrounds and characters. Despite this, they always remained interested in coming back to their Lord of the Rings roots, and perhaps even create content for Middle-earth. At this point, it is important to make clear who owns the Lord of the Rings IP in the first place, in order to make this a reality. The simplest way to describe the situation is this. The rights to the vast majority of Tolkien's works and writings, including the Lord of the Rings trilogy, The Hobbit and The Silmarillion, are held by the Tolkien estate, which itself is very closely affiliated to the Tolkien family. Essentially, if you're interested in the actual literature of the franchise and its printing, it is the Tolkien estate that you would have to talk to. On the other hand, the Tolkien Enterprises, which is now known as Middle-earth Enterprises and not the Tolkien estate, holds the executive rights to the motion picture, merchandising, stage and other rights in certain literary works of J.R.R. Tolkien, including The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. As such, if you are Peter Jackson and you wish to create a Lord of the Rings movie trilogy, it is from the Tolkien Enterprises that you would have to get the rights. These two different bodies that manage different aspects of The Lord of the Rings exist because in 1969, Tolkien himself sold the movie and merchandising rights of his works to the United Artists Corporation for over £100,000 and they in turn sold them to producer Saul Zanes in 1976 for $3 million. Zanes then established Tolkien Enterprises which would from then on manage the film and game rights of The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. It should be mentioned that these two organizations, the Tolkien Estate and the Tolkien or Middle-earth enterprises have come into conflict before, notoriously in recent years, when the Tolkien estate sued Middle-earth enterprises for producing Lord of the Rings casino and gambling games, though that is a story for another time. In this video, we'll explore talks conducted between everyone I've mentioned so far, including Tolkien's son, Christopher, regarding a potential collaboration between the Lord of the Rings and Dungeons and & Dragons, including a fully licensed Lord of the Rings tabletop, as well as sequel and prequel novels to the Lord of the Rings. In the early 90s, with the growing success of Dungeons & Dragons, representatives of the Tolkien Enterprises had come into contact with the D&D publishers at TSR, with the hope of negotiating a mutually beneficial deal in which TSR would be allowed to create D&D content for the world of Middle-earth, in a manner similar to the Forgotten Realms. Famous Tolkien scholar and author John Radcliffe, who has worked on titles such as Eberron as well as 3rd edition's Player Handbook, took the lead in this new relationship and represented TSR. In this same period of time, TSR had gone on to publish a series of books with a notable example being The Legacy by Robert Salvatore set in the Forgotten Realms. And seeing the considerable potential for profit from literature, their wish was to release new books set within the world of The Lord of the Rings and on which they would attach their role-playing game. In fact, it is claimed that Lorraine Williams, who managed TSR at the time, Time and who is known for eventually selling D&D to Wizards of the Coast, was dead set on TSR publishing original fiction, both prequels and sequels to The Lord of the Rings. Given the success of the book department at the time, the company saw this generating endless piles of cash. The original plan for a role-playing game set in Middle-earth was approved by the Tolkien Enterprises, under the guise of this hypothetical tabletop being considered merchandise attached to their Lord of the Rings movie rights that I mentioned earlier. In order for them to be able to publish new fiction set in Middle-earth, however, they would need the permission of the Tolkien estate and J.R.R. Tolkien's son, Christopher Tolkien. 
In the past, back in the 80s, Tolkien Enterprises had attempted something similar when they had licensed the Lord of the Rings rights to Iron Crown for the Middle Earth role playing tabletop, which almost got the latter into bankruptcy when they were forced by the Tolkien estate to recall and destroy all pieces of a series of interactive novels that they had made called Tolkien Quest, which were set in Middle Earth and were attached to the role playing game. As such, in order for this endeavor to move forward and for a repeat of the Iron Crown fiasco to be avoided, the Tolkien estate had to be on board, alongside Tolkien Enterprises and TSR. By this time, TSR lead Lorraine Williams had wished for the Lord of the Rings to become a larger factor of her company's plans for the future, starting with novels and tabletop and continuing with video games, calendars and spin-offs all produced and sold by TSR. With this in mind, in 1992, John Ratliff was sent to England in order to negotiate with Christopher Tolkien himself directly, who at the time was the chairman of the Tolkien estate. After having presented TSR's vision for the Lord of the Rings IP and the potential of introducing new fiction to Middle-earth not written by Tolkien himself, the answer of Christopher Tolkien was, as you can imagine from the lack of a Return of the King sequel, a resounding no. In fact, the stance of the Tolkien estate was that not a single word or syllable more would be written in the world of Middle-earth, and no permission would be given for any new books in that setting. They were however open to the idea of granting permission for everything else planned by TSR, including the merchandise and most importantly, the role-playing game or a Middle-earth D&D setting. When Radcliffe came back to the US though and reported this to the TSR executives, William said that a Middle-earth setting for Dungeons & Dragons without new books was not worth our while. As such, even though TSR had the opportunity to make a tabletop after all in some form, they did not take it and Middle-earth never became an officially licensed setting for D&D. The chance was missed. And only a decade later, the Lord of the Rings movie trilogy would be released, and the IP would become more popular than ever before, with TSR itself going defunct in 1997 and Dungeons and Dragons being sold away. Thank you very much for watching. 